Marriage can be difficult as we've been unpacking in this special series of Ask Dr. Betters. My name is Melissa Weisenfels and I serve as the Executive Director here at MarkInc.org. And in this special series, we've invited both Dr. Betters and his wife, Sharon, to participate in this video as they share with us the inside glimpse of their marriage over the past 50 years that they've been together, the challenges that they've faced, and the ways in which they've overcome those challenges. This is a special year for Mark Inc. as it is its 25th anniversary, so we thought it was the perfect timing to blend uh, these celebrations and share these milestones with you, our listeners. So Chuck and Sharon, welcome. Um, in part three of this marriage series, I want to dig into the early years of marriage, really focusing on that one to 10 year mark. Um, I talked to a lot of people. We've received a lot of questions from our listeners that um, really seem to point to those years as being extra stressful, um, having extra levels of frustration. Um, it seems like in today's society, it's during those first several years that you're trying to really get established, get a job, uh, earn enough money to buy the house, to get the kids, to pay for schools, to do activities. And there's this tremendous pressure, I feel like, that we've put on ourselves in society, many of which are in two-income households, um, trying to juggle it all. So um, for both of you, um, looking at those years or even just those situations um, where the stress and the frustration builds up, um, what can you share about those times um, and how you handled those frustrations and or disappointments that you faced? Well, one thing I want to say off, off the top is there's no one cookie cutter way for a marriage to, to work. Ours has worked for 50 years because there are certain non-negotiables uh, that we have embraced, that we just believe if left intact, and if, if you keep going back to those non-negotiables, uh, I think that God can use those uh, to build a strong marriage. For example, the non-negotiable of your personal relationship to Jesus Christ, where he is the center of what you're trying to be and what you're trying to do. Secondly is the fact that my wife is my partner, she is my partner, and we mutually respect one another, and that mutual respect is, is uh, especially when conflicts arise, there is, a, there is a mutual respect for each other that goes a long way. Now, having said that, in the first year of a marriage, generally speaking, now I'm not talking about every single time, but generally speaking, there are, there are crises in the first year of marriage, there are crises in the uh, fifth year of marriage and crises in the 10th year of marriage. And the reason for that is your circumstances are changing. In the first year of marriage, there is, a, there is a, um, an adjustment that is taking place. In the fifth year of marriage, there are financial decisions that you've made uh, where the fruits are coming to bear one way or the other. Children, you're starting to have children. In that year five through 10, you're starting to learn how to parent and parent the right way and learning your parenting styles, et cetera. So there's all kinds of conflicts that could take place in the first 10 years of a marriage. When we were talking about doing this series, um, I asked Sharon the question, I said, if we could go back to any time in our life, and, and she said the same thing to me, if we go back to any time in our life, and, and relive those years, what would they be? And my answer was the first 10 years of our, of our marriage were probably the greatest years of learning and growing and solidifying that partnership, solidifying our relationship with Christ. In ministry, we were in Philadelphia most of those 10 years. And in Philadelphia, we were in some pretty bad neighborhoods and I was learning to cut my teeth in ministry. What we observed in those years in the, in the inner city of Philadelphia were what life is not supposed to look like, what a marriage is not supposed to look like. Uh, when I did counseling in Philadelphia, I had to build trees of who does this kid belong to? Who's his mother? Who's his father? Where did they come from? And, and we, we, I would build these trees to try to find out who's the legitimate mother and father of this child. And, and where, are these, where are these generational sins coming from? It was extremely difficult. We would do evangelism on, this, on the street corners and in the houses, and Sharon would go and, 
And we would literally jump over, over walls and that separated people's houses in the row houses. And we would introduce, we would knock on the doors to introduce people to Jesus. And there were gunshots on the street. We would hear gunshots going off on the street. Uh, our neighborhood was one of the toughest neighborhoods in Philadelphia for gang killings. And so we were cutting our teeth in ministry. And because of the fact that we were forged together in the early years of our ministry where nobody really believed in what we were doing. Eventually they came around to believe it, but in those early years, we moved out of our home, our apartment in, in Delaware in one week. In another week, we moved into a place in the seminary where I was starting seminary. Within another week, we moved out and we went into our first parsonage, a massive 12 room parsonage uh, in the inner city. Uh, two of us in that massive building, uh, just learning how to cut our teeth in ministry. And what we decided early on, early on in, the, in, the, in the, those first 10 years, our marriage was going to be centered in our home. And our home was going to become a safe place for people to come. We were going to practice the biblical concept of hospitality. There's a price tag on that. Your home gets damaged. You get all kinds of weird people coming into your home. Uh, you get people, I mean, some of the kids who had no mothers or fathers to speak of. Um, there are times we had to kick them out because they wanted to be in our environment. They wanted to see what a healthy family structure looks like. I mean, there were kids that were getting D's and F's on their report card that I brought into our home. And we ministered to them. We taught them how to memorize scripture. We trained their brains to memorize not just verses, but chapters of scripture. And we watched their grades go up because their minds were being conditioned. It was hard work. Sometimes two, three o'clock in the morning, I'm out on the street um, dealing with drug addicts and gangs and what have you. It was, it was hard, hard work. I saw it from one perspective because I'm out on the streets and Sharon saw it from another perspective because she packs the kids up in a baby coach and takes them down to the library. And I'm, I'm thinking the whole time she's going down to the library, there are gangs out there. You're not safe out there. It was a tough, tough environment. But our home became the focal point of our marriage and hospitality. There, there was one time we had over 100 kids in our home. Uh, they were up the steps. They were into our daughter's uh, uh, crib room where she was. Uh, they, were, they were lined up outside to get in. Our home became a haven for those kids. So we wanted to take the broken places that we came from and that our marriage came from and that those generational sins that we talked about in, in the previous video, we wanted, to, we wanted to make our home the contraindicator for that. We wanted our home to be the answer to that. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, and I think that it started with our <clears throat> own need for a safe place. We needed to be safe with one another. Um, having said that, the challenges, it's interesting because we look back on that period, but when we really start and saying that was the happiest time for us, it was also painful and hard because we were being, um, we were in the refiner's fire on many different levels. We lived, we had a poverty level income. I remember praying over the Reader's Digest sweepstakes every time because it always <laughs> happened around tax time and we didn't have enough money. And I would say, Lord, if we could just win, we could pay our bills and we'll, we'll invest it in the church. And you know, I was being very spiritual, but I was terrified because our money was so short. Um, being, learning how to be a pastor, Chuck was, he was a Christian for a year before he became a pastor, coming out of not a Protestant background. So that was challenging because I knew the right way to do things. And that was when he finally told me in a very nice voice, I will say, you're not my Holy Spirit. You have to let me fall. You have to let me mess up. Let me if back up for a second. There's, there's one thing that I think is important for us to note here. <clears throat> Early on in the marriage, and this is part of the raising that I came from, even though our family had no money, my father never really permitted my mother to go out to work. And we made a commitment early on in the marriage 
that she would not work we, outside the home. We would not become dependent on her income. Now, my income was sitting below the poverty level. We weren't making, there were times where we had to wonder whether or not we were going to be able to buy food that week because we literally had no money to, no coins to rub together. And those years were what we call miracle years. We saw God work miracle after miracle after miracle providing for us. I mean, there were times where we just blurted it out to the Lord. We have this value. She could have gone to work and she could have made a lot more money than I was making because of her training. But who's going to take care of these kids? Um, who's going to provide this home environment? Who's going to be the heart and soul of church life ministry when the, when the pastor's out on the streets? Um, and, and so we made that commitment early on in the marriage that put a lot of financial pressure on us, a lot of financial pressure, where, but we were not committed to making financial decisions apart from each other. We made those decisions together. I mean, I'll give you one example of a bad decision. We needed a new car. And I went out to uh, the big showroom out in Northeast Philadelphia, and I found a used car, and I brought it home in the early 70s. I realized when I got it home, I had made a bad decision. I bought a 455 cubic inch LeSabre Buick used, and then the gas crisis hit. <laughs> this thing got like three miles per gallon on it. And now I'm sitting in lines uh, blocks long during the early 70s with the, with the gas crisis, filling this beast up because it was a bad decision. She figured I knew about cars. I didn't know about cars. I didn't know I was buying the biggest engine made in those days. Uh, and so we made some bad decisions along the way. But she never said, I told you so. She never, she never rubbed it in my face. And we watched in those early years, miracle after miracle, foods, cars. Uh, we also made a commitment to tithe. 10% of our below poverty income was tithe. Most people would look at that and say, why are you giving that much money? Um, well, first of all, it wasn't that much money, but it was, it was a tithe that was a lot of money for us. But then as our income started to grow over the next 10 years, the miracles started to decrease because it was God's way of saying to us, I'm your provision. Would you agree with that? I absolutely would. One of the things that we um, were blessed with in those early years is just around the time we were getting married, a lot of Christian ministries were producing resources. I wouldn't say a lot, a few, like Focus on the Family started producing video resources for marriage and parenting and things like that. There were conferences that were being held that were really revolutionary for building Christian homes and Christian marriages. And whenever we had the opportunity to go, we went. We, we, and we soaked up, we took notes, uh, we soaked it up, and God was giving us a template. You we don't see that anymore. Yeah, you just don't see that anymore. There, but there are many resources that are available out there, and I would suggest to uh, especially any any marriage, wherever you are, whatever season you are in, take care of um, of of learning. You haven't learned it all. You'll never learn it all. We have friends who say they go to a marriage conference every single year. They're committed to it. They started their marriage that way, and they've been married for over thirty years, but they still go. So um, it's but but. Uh, to, to go back to your question, there we had to deal with sin in our lives in those first 10 years. We dealt with fear and control and people-pleasing and anger and all the sins that come with being human. Fear. Fear. Um, and yet when I look back on it now, even though I remember crying a lot and um, being terrified we couldn't pay our bills and all those things, God met us there in a remarkable way. And, and taught us uh, about how to uh, seek forgiveness and how to forgive and how to experience grace. So, I, I, and, and it breaks my heart uh, when I hear about couples, and it seems like there's so many who, after three or four years of marriage, are divorcing in this culture. I think you, you, can't, you can't give up. You have to push it through. And divorce was never in our vocabulary. No matter how hard it got, we, we knew that was a pathway that we were going to go down. 
You know, there's a there's another aspect to this that I think is important. Um, <clears throat> during those early years, during those first 10 years, we're starting to have our children too. And with each of them comes expense. Hmm. It's expensive to raise children. And we're watching as God is making these miraculous provisions, which we knew we couldn't take for granted. Our car blew up in front of our house. It blew up. Nobody knew that it blew up. It was, the engine was shot. We had no, and a pastor needs a car. I needed it to go to school. I needed it to go to, to streets to visit people. And I will never forget this man came to our house one day, and nobody knew that our car blew up. He wanted to ask me some theological questions. He was a man in our church. Uh, he's with the Lord now. And he came to the door. We, we talked about the theological questions. And as he was leaving, he's walking down the steps. He turns around. And he says, oh, by the way, I have, a, I have a car for you. I want to give you a car. He said, I, I bought this new car. And he said, I really didn't need to buy this new car, but I want to give you a car. Now, what would your logic say to you? You're getting the old car. Mm-hmm. I got the new car. He, he came to me and he says, I want you to have this car. Nobody knew that. Nobody understood that this was, this was a miracle that was taking place right in front of us. We can go story after story after story. We could either fight with each other. We could get mad at each other. We could say, rubbing in our face the, the bad decisions that we made financially. Or we could pull together as you're supposed to, as partners, and you can pray together as you're supposed to as Christians. And you can lay this burden before the only one who can really fix it. And that's the Lord. And as he, he taught us those lessons in those early 10 years. And if we were to go back, that's what we would want to go back to in terms of God's provisions for us. What I'm hearing a lot of what you're saying is having your priorities straight really focusing on um, setting some priorities in your marriage to protect your marriage, to to be pointing each other toward Christ, and um, relying on, on Him um, to provide. Speak next to the people who, after hearing what you're saying, are are believers, they're praying, they are waiting to see those miracles, those provisions, those blessings um, along their, their journey where they're, they're in a struggling situation. They are, they are desperate. They're frustrated. Um, and really, it's starting to build up resentment and bitterness in their marriage. It's creeping, it's creeping in because they don't see those miracles. Uh, the car's not being given. The food's not being paid for. Um, and they just can't quite seem to get to that point of forgiveness either that you're talking about. Um, how, do you, how do you speak to them? Have, have you ever been to that point? I think that um, what I, if someone was sitting in front of me and painting that picture, um, the first thing I would do is, is talk about what is your relationship to the Lord? Is it um, you go to church and that's it? Or do you have an intimacy with the Lord? Are you, do you spend time with Him? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about where you are spiritually. How much are you pouring into your own uh, spiritual welfare and going back to those non-negotiables. Do you have non-negotiables in your marriage? And I and my heart aches. For, I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, and sometimes I, you know, I think, Lord, why why is there no movement here? When yet in our own marriage, I have to admit there were times where I felt like there was no movement. You know, it was it was uh, I, I'm impatient and waiting for the Lord to intervene was scary. So I get that part of it, but I think if you, especially if you're in a marriage with a spouse who doesn't share your faith or who shows up on Sundays but is not there other times, what are you supposed to do? We have to keep going back to the cross. We have to keep going back to, I am God's child, and He has promised He will never leave me or forsake me. So this is a journey where He's promised to give me those treasures in the darkness that will help turn my heart toward Him. And so my my thing would be you have to keep going back to what does it what does His Word say for you personally and in your own heart. And these are times also, Melissa, where I think um, God can reveal sin in our own hearts. We have to start there, 
and introduce humility? Is there a way for us to humble ourselves? But even after all of that, if you have a hard-hearted spouse, mm -hmm. it, it is possible for the bitterness to creep in. And so I think about that passage in Hebrews where it says, um, you know, to guard your heart because bitterness will defile many if you don't yank it out. So you could have a thought of, I want to keep a clean slate with my spouse. That may not be getting you anywhere, but keeping a clean slate with the Lord and continuing to run back to Him. Secondly, I think you need friends. You need community. A few chosen friends where you're not going to be complaining about your marriage to everybody you meet, and but you have a few people. Like for us, those conferences were wonderful for us, and it, it kept us back, got us back on track when we were struggling with issues. And so I think godly friends and making sure you're in a strong community where you have those relationships, uh, where you can say, I don't want to talk about the situation, but I really need prayer right now, and knowing that that person is going to pray for you. I think it's important also to listen to your spouse. I mean, <clears throat> we men are proud. There's, there's a pride in us where we want to fix everything. I mean, I learned early on in the marriage that she has a sixth sense. And that sixth sense needs to be factored in. It needs to be considered. There were times where she would warn me, I don't like your relationship to this person, especially when it came to women I was counseling or something like that. What are you, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't see any of that. Um, and she would say, I don't know either, but just trust me on this. She proved to be right every single time every time. And still, you know, with our stubbornness as men, th that kind of trust and respect for your wife's opinion, it goes into other areas too, like managing money uh, or how you're going to discipline the children. Well, in wrapping up this, this segment, um, last thoughts, um, it seems like a lot of things come back to that communication, conflict, resolving conflict, and communication. How do we um, handle that in our marriages, whether we're, we're in a good place and we're listening, you know, the communication goes both ways. I've learned from you also. It's not only the talking, it's the listening, which you were just alluding to. So that's a perfect segue into um, your final thoughts about conflict and communication in marriage. What, when I, um, of my projects was writing a book on encouragement. It's called Treasures of Encouragement. And the core passage was from Hebrews chapter 10. And one of the phrases in there is consider carefully how to encourage one another. And it was in the context of people who were suffering. They were terrified because of the persecution that was coming their way. And they were experiencing broken relationships. And right in the middle of it, the writer of Hebrews says, consider carefully how to encourage one another. And that goes, start in your marriage. Consider carefully how to help turn your spouse's heart toward the Lord. And often that is by the way you present yourself to your spouse, um, in your relationship to your spouse. But also going back to communication is, it, it's important I think for us to remember the grid through which they are hearing us and the grid through which they are speaking. I mean, as a kind of a comical way of uh, explaining that, Chuck has introduced me to golf and I hated it. Um, I like it now, I have fun now, but I'll never forget one round of golf at the very first hole, he said, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You, this is your game. I said, well, just give me one piece of information. So he did. And I thought that for 17 holes, I was doing what he told me to do, and it was not working. It was awful. I, I just hated what I was doing. And I said, Chuck, I, I don't understand. What am I doing? And so he explained it again using slightly different words. I heard exactly the opposite on hole one that I heard on hole 18. And when I figured out that his language is different than mine. That made a difference in the way I thought, if, if I misheard him in golf, how many times do I mishear him every single day? And I'm interpreting him in a way that he never meant to be interpreted. And so it keeps coming back to scripture, you know, whatever is true, whatever is um, it, good about the other person, think good things, you know, don't question their motives. Uh, starting out at that point. And so remembering that grid, and also we haven't talked a lot about it, but I think it's always an undercurrent, it's dying to self. 
It's uh, humbling ourselves before the Lord and before this person that we love so much and seeking forgiveness and extending grace because we have been extended grace upon grace upon grace. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus from Philippians, was an early hymn of the church. They used to sing this to one another. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him, and has given him a name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I would challenge the men to apply that principle of relinquishing your rights and taking upon yourself the form of a servant and girding the apron and serving your wife and serving your children is the pathway to hearing correctly and speaking correctly words that build up. Thank you both so very much for sharing your thoughts. Um, we do know marriage can be difficult, but it's also um, an opportunity for tremendous blessings as you've shared, and there's an opportunity through each year to, to look back and see what the Lord is doing, not only in yourself, but in your spouse, and your family situation. And I think that perspective that you're sharing after 50 years of marriage, to be able to look back and say, hang in there. The Lord is at work. There is there's something more to, to come of this, and it is for your good. Um, based on his will and his plan for your life. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this video. We certainly hope that it's been helpful to you. Um, and we have many more resources available for you at markinc.org, as well as on our podcast. So we hope that you'll check out the other Ask Dr. Better videos um, that we have produced. This one is special on marriage, and um, we encourage all of you to, to really take an opportunity to look at your marriage and your spouse and yourself um, and see what areas you can um, improve on and and give to the Lord and put at the foot of the cross. Um, maybe there's some areas that you need to seek forgiveness or humble yourself, and we certainly encourage you to do so, as well as find a community of people to come alongside you um, to strengthen your marriage for the years to come. Again, please check out markinc.org, where you will find all kinds of resources available to you free of charge. And if these resources have been helpful to you, we hope that you would prayerfully consider supporting our ministry and the work that we do so it can be a blessing to others. In our last and final episode of this series on marriage um, coming up, you'll hear a little bit more about the spiritual practices that we should be putting into place to safeguard our marriages. Hope you'll join us. Thank you for watching this series on Raw Marriage produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. For a gift of any size, you can receive a copy of this series by following the link below or visiting markinc.org.